When you were a kid, did business. When you were a kid, when you were. Ah, uh, yeah, well, um, I was. I'm so old that I was already alive when they landed on the moon. So <laughs> when I was six years old, everybody was watching that and landed. That was, that was a, landed on the moon. The promotion for this on television, and, and we all watched it, and we all wanted uh, to be astronauts flying. Obviously, in Spain, it was a little bit more difficult than in the States by then. And then, well, I studied aeronautical engineering, and uh, well, little by little, it became a little bit more likely that I could. And you uh, tell us about the the missions that you ended up flying on. Yeah, so I started in uh, ESA in 1986, doing orbital dynamics programs and things like that. In '92. I was uh, selected into the to the astronaut corps, and then I flew two times. One time in the space shuttle with uh, Mr. Steve Robinson and uh, Senator Glenn, yeah. and some other guys who nobody <laughs> remembers probably <laughs> because of because of Senator Glenn. And um, and then the second time that was 1998 and 2003, I flew in a Soyuz. Uh, spacecraft to the International Space Station and stayed there for 10 days. So with that history, with that experience you've had in space, um, let's talk a little bit about what happens to your body in space. You know, a lot of things happen, you know, change in space. Um, can you talk a little bit about what, what, what kind of things change and how aware are you of those changes? Yes, there are several changes that happen. Um, they are, let's say, in different time scales. So first, there are, there are the, the quick changes that uh, well, the, the rocket pushes on you, and, and therefore you have you have this force on your back. Yeah. And when you get to space with the jolt, at least in the Soyuz, it was a big jolt. Mm. Then uh, then you start actually falling. So there's, there's no way to tell being in space and falling. So that that creates some some short term effects uh, that uh, your um, inner ear system and your equilibrium, your balance system doesn't work anymore. So you don't know up from down and so on. So one of the first effects of space is disorientation. If you don't kind of uh, orient with your eyes and with your training. And uh, quickly after that, uh, one other effect of space can be uh, motion sickness. Some people have it, some people don't. We actually, as far as I know, we don't have a test on ground that will tell us who's going to have motion sickness and who isn't. Right. And then... Um, well, after that, then of course, in, almost immediately, you start uh, uh, with moving about in in zero g, and uh, then the next uh, change that you can see happens in space is that um, uh, due to some uh, physiological, uh, let's say, disbalances of the of the body by being in zero g. Mm -hmm. which work very well on 1G, then you start uh, accumulating some fluid on the upper part of your body. And that happens in, uh, in with a time scale of hours, several hours, and you start feeling that, that your the, the, the fluid um, in between your cells in, mm -hmm. on the upper part of the body is more and on the legs is less. And that you may even feel like you have a stuffy nose because obviously the sinus also gets swelled, swollen. And um, and then, of course, the, the, the next thing that happens is when you adapt to space or when you have been there for a very long time, then uh, other adaptations occur that, um, that make you weaker, let's say, so because you don't need your muscles, you don't need your bones. So the, the body adapts to... A long, very long stays in in zero g by uh, losing uh, bone mass and also losing like muscle mass and also there's another adaptation that is the the, 
let's say the control of your muscles becomes different. You, you, you use much less force to do things that you would do here with more. That is our long term and this is uh, the most dangerous, let's say, of the adaptations because it doesn't necessarily um, revert by itself when you come back to Earth. So this is, this is uh, let's say, we, we fight this last adaptation of, of the long term by doing a lot of exercise. So, as these changes happen to your body, what? How aware are you? Do you realize that your body is changing? I mean, I certainly remember the the short term effects, and it was a combination of feeling. Um, it was exciting because it was such so new, but it was disturbing because sometimes, um, you know, these things didn't feel correct. It's like your body shouldn't be feeling like that. Um, but in the long term. Does it change your sense of how your body is actually relating to your environment? I would say certainly yeah, all of this disorientation is not really an adaptation. It's, uh, uh, it's actually the adaptation or the, 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 the change that occurs in your body is that you quit feeling disoriented at some point. So, so you adapt. Uh, basically, you adapt the gains in the control mechanisms of your um, of your sensors inside your inner ear, so that uh, you cannot forget those that don't work there. Um, but I don't think you, you get you are aware of this happening. You are aware that you're feeling better, or you're feeling more like swift moving without uh, clumsiness, but. Right. I don't think you feel it. One thing you really are aware that your body is different is, is this stuffiness in your face. Mm -hmm. Obviously, when you look on the on your mirror, mm -hmm. but also because it it feels a little bit like you are allergic or something. There's this there's, 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 right. there's a sense of like, mm, and as you know, everybody asks, does your sense of taste change in space? Well, since you are swollen, then obviously. Lots of things change in the sense of taste and smell. You, you mentioned uh, that you learned to use much less force to move around. I remember being very clumsy at first and being amazed at meeting astronauts who had been up there for several months and how differently they moved to how, to how we moved, the newcomers. And it seemed... Oh, yes. Uh, I... I I really remember that, and that that's really startling. How you how you see that the others have come to a to a I don't know a, a being one with space and zero g that it is totally effortless that they can they can travel totally effortless at twice the speed that you go bumping everywhere. So and there's kind of a grace to it too, to an experienced. You know, it's 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 like going to the ballet and watching people move. It's a little push here, a little tiny push there. It's it's like uh, I don't know somebody um, going up the mountain without uh, any 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 gear, and right. when they have done it for I don't know for years, then it is <laughs> absolutely amazing how how, can, how they can do that. So once you've adapted and have all these fine-tuned motions and the internal physiology, physiology of your body is adapted to this, this sense of free fall, which is not exactly zero gravity because you're in a gravitational field, but you're in orbit, which means you're falling all the time. You're just not hitting. So once your body and you adapt to all these things, then you come home. So what, what was that like for you? Yeah, that um, it can be even harder. Well, first of all, to say that in the 10 days that I spent the first time and the 10 days I spent the second time, I I saw that I was very far from reaching the the grace and the adaptation of the people who have been there six months. So it's, yes. it's, it's much longer than 10 days. And then when you come back, it's, it's also different. So by being there 10 days, then... You, um, it takes a, it takes quite a while. So I, I, I sometimes tell uh, 
people who ask me about this is um, the force of gravity is really very 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 strong and it overwhelms everything and it it takes babies three months to to uh, develop the muscles to be able to even raise their heads from the bed hmm. and and one full year normally to be able to stand so so it is something that you don't notice anymore, but it is a very, very strong force. So yes, it, it really takes, uh, it is startling how you feel when you come back to, to how, how, how uh, aware are you of gravity once you come to, to Earth again. I remember coming home from my first flight and for the first time in my life being aware of how heavy my head was. It's like there's this yes, you start to big think. lump on totally. the top of your shoulders. You can't, you can't, uh, you can never forget that moment, really. No, <laughs> it's very true, and you can't really simulate it either. Uh, well, I know a centrifuge, maybe or something. Yeah, yeah. I think you're more maybe, maybe so. You might be more prepared for the the total g loading. Um, let's talk about. Space. And I also remember. Um, feeling that my arm was extremely heavy and that didn't that wasn't because the muscles have lost really their uh, let's say mass and strength right. it, it was because my brain wasn't putting the signal right to really lift it so when you're doing a spacewalk and you're Inside a spacesuit, what do you think? Do you think that the spacesuit is sort of a way to give humans the superpowers to exist in this terrible environment, or is it just a safety suit to keep our delicate bodies alive? Uh, more like the second thing. I I trained with uh, with you there, yeah. but I never got to to get out. That's uh, that's something I would really like to. Um, I think the spacesuit is uh, is still something quite clumsy, but that's that's all we can do to work outside. It's um, it's just this, the second thing you said. So it's a, a way to keep our very delicate bodies from from well getting immediately destroyed in in space. Do you think, you know, in talking about all these things that happen to our bodies, um, they're only an issue because we seem to be very interested in putting human bodies in, into space. But, you know, now with technology, um, virtual environments, do you think that as the generations get more accepting of virtual environments and how immersive they are and how convincing they are, are we going to not require humans to do our explorations for the human race? Or are we going to be accepting of just visiting there ourselves in a virtual sense? Uh, no, I don't think so. It's, um, I mean, exploration is something that um, requires explorers. There's no, there's no. I don't think there's an analogy between exploration and 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 sending. Um, remote control devices to look for something that, uh, to, to, to take uh, samples or to, to, take, to make measurements. Mm. So people want to have somebody come back and tell how it was. It's just, just the way we, we are. So I, I don't think that will ever happen. But still, uh, yeah, there will be a lot of things that uh, will be done by artificial artificial intelligence at some point. But taking into account the the distances um, to like the planets and and the time the signals uh, take to to come back and forth and so so therefore the inability to actually intervene in case the automatic system doesn't work very well. I think the astronaut job in the Let's say in the in the, the the way of being an explorer, the astronaut job will be not the first one by far that 
uh, that will be replaced by artificial intelligence. So we maybe our maybe our heritage and tradition of, of storytellers makes us require a, a real human body to go there and have that experience and bring it back to us, rather than us have a simulated experience. <clears throat> I, I yes, tend to I, agree with you, but I, I'm of the same generation you are. I do wonder about two generations or more that's now. True. You, you need to find the proper analogy. I don't, I don't have it now, but let's say, have you explored the bottom of the sea? If you have uh, sent a camera to uh, to bring some video over there. But of course, the question is another one: is uh, will you spend much more money to send somebody? That's the whole idea. And risk. And and risk. No, well, risk is you always find somebody who who may take the risk, and and you are always there. Are always ways to minimize the risk in such a way that uh, the investment becomes, let's say, reasonable, like for example, for governments. But um, what? What analogy could we could we have? Is it, is it the same, or, or maybe maybe the new generation will, will be contempt by seeing a three D representation of Machu Picchu with a little bit of uh, smell pouring out of the television instead of going there? I don't know. Probably maybe, not. Maybe it depends on how many senses are involved in the virtual experience. You know, everybody's working towards that. Um, but I I think. It's more than just sens sensory analysis. It is the spiritual, the thing we call experience, which means more than just sense. It's part of the processing into a into a meaning, and that's what you know. A sensor package on some remote place is not going to give us, I don't think. No, probably not. And and also it, it because of the di distances. It will never be interactive. So you can't oh, that's a good point. Explain that. So it is. You can. You could have a sort of set of sensors uh, sitting on top of Everest, and then sit on your coach and have gear on on you, and then like be there. But also being there means. Doing something is not just looking. So you, you would be able to tell, to turn. You will be able to see the other people who have come with you. And but that would require that so, something on top of Everest is communicating with your computer in a sort of real time or, or semi-real time. But that's totally yeah. It's not even conceivable uh, doing that in a planet. It will only be recordings. And. I also wonder if perhaps risk, actual human risk, is part of what defines our need for exploration. Well, no, you are getting very deep here. Yeah, yeah, yes. <laughs> That's the whole point of this class. Okay. Well, you know, there's a long Actually, tradition. Risk. Well. It has much to do, yes. Uh, so the explorer is something, somebody who took the risk that regular people was were not prepared to take, and then came back and, and told them how it was, and and maybe opened a new uh, a new area in which everybody could go. Yeah. And and this has been something that. You know, a long line of explorers from Spain have been doing for hundreds of years. Um, do your countrymen see you as the latest in this long tradition of Spanish explorers? Oh, well, you always find the odd person who <laughs> who makes that connection, you know, the, the, the one, one every hundred or something, but... Well, this, there's been it's been a long time since since the worst the, since the, the the front of explore, exploration was done by 
Portuguese on one side and Spaniards on the other side. So, yes, yeah, sometimes they have called me the something, the the somebody, and take whatever explorer of the 20th century or something like that. But, uh, or even a little bit on the 21st now. But, um, but no, that, that's not generalized. No, I don't think people look at it like that. What do you think? No, I'm, it's what I think, because I've been thinking about this uh, a little bit, is that the subsidy, there's very little, um, very little correlation. So it, it, it is not the same kind of thing. So the explorers in the 14th and 1500s, they were... Uh, people who did it all for themselves and uh, created the exploration, uh, the program of explorations for themselves and got financing and got friends and, and workers or somebody to help them and they were, they were in charge of the whole thing. Whereas we fly in space uh, on the backs of hundreds of thousands of people who are creating the machines. So we, we, it's not the same. We are, we're not doing a, an individual uh, feed. Or we are taking the risk. We are uh, trying to be very, very efficient. All of that, yeah, that's true. But uh, it, is, it, is, it has nothing to do with the experts of those times that, that were... Uh, that had personal merit in the exploration. Well, I'm sure that um, your your position as Spain's first space traveler has uh, inspired and motivated other people to do so. So hopefully the tradition of, of Spanish explorers will continue with you at least as a link in the chain. Yeah, it would be... It would be really nice to see that. Um, I mean, it is already very nice to to hear people say, "Yes, my my daughter went to engineering because uh, they saw you on television." All those things are extremely rewarding and uh, get you going. Certainly, yes. Um, there's a yeah. The, the analogy stops more or less there because the the 1400s were a time where uh, yeah, there were there were investments being done to to reap uh, economical in, economical benefits, and of of those monies that were obtained by by exploration is, is how the whole thing was financed. So, Spain was not only the country who was exploring, but at the same time was the richest country. That was the the reason one was the reason for the other. So. At this point, I don't know. It's uh, the only thing that we can we can probably hope for is for Europe to become a little bit more uh, preeminent and to participate with more resources to the exploration, which we are currently doing uh, in a very small. Uh, I mean, with with uh, with a very small contribution, for example, to the ISS or to the possible new trips. Far away. Well, Pedro, this has been a great conversation. Thanks so much for visiting the uh, um, our class and UC Davis and talking to me. And uh, hope to see you in person uh, um, maybe next year or next time I come to um, to Europe. I am really looking forward to seeing your beautiful piece of Europe in America. 